It was just a phase. Just a phase? You had a sexy phase? It meant nothing. I didn't think it would count. It meant nothing? I was just a little bi curious. Well, honey, I'm a little bi curious. You know, out of all the videos I've made in my seven years on YouTube, I never once thought that my Dragons of the Nine Realms Season 1 video would be the video that would be considered my breakthrough. I mean, that Lilo and Stitch video came pretty close at one point. Don't talk crap about Lilo and Stitch in my presence. It was about a year ago now that my first video on the Nine Realms just completely blew up and changed this channel forever. So clearly the right move now is to completely sell out and just make videos based on how to train your dragon, right? <laughs> Well, believe it or not, I've been wanting to make this particular video for quite some time now, before the Nine Realms was even a thing. And I especially want to thank Atlas VPN for sponsoring this particular video. If you're like the titular character of this particular video, that likely means that you have people out there who are making your life a whole lot harder than it has to be, right? Well, maybe not exactly the same, but hey, having your internet and private information be hacked is kind of like having your entire village be destroyed by a biological brother. At least to me. I mean, having internet is kind of important for my job, so, you know, tomato, tomato. That's why Atlas VPN is exactly what you need. Stopping ads and malware dead in its tracks, your device has never been more safe from hackers and malicious links that mean you harm. But it doesn't stop there. Atlas VPN also allows you to unlock certain access to features that might not really be available in your country. What's that? Race to the Edge isn't available to you wherever you are? Well, with Atlas VPN, yes it is. I don't know what you're talking about, it's right there. Atlas VPN works on all devices, which means protected software, unlimited access to the world, and the best part of it all is, it's only $1.83 a month, with the first three months being absolutely free. All you have to do is use my link in the description and pinned comment to get this special deal that won't be here forever. And if you're not satisfied, which like, why wouldn't you be? Then there is a 30 day money back guarantee. It's affordable, it's powerful, it's what you need exactly. It's Atlas VPN. The weight of the world is on their shoulders, not yours. So special thanks to Atlas VPN for sponsoring this video. Now, where were we? Oh, yes, how to train your dragon. It should be no secret that I, like so many people, absolutely adore how to train your dragon. It's just one of those movies that comes out of nowhere and completely shocks the hell out of you by being as good as it is. Despite having a pretty cliched story, honestly, it works with every one of them in such a deep and unique way that manages to get you invested in its characters, the world of Burke, and especially the dragons. I never made a video on the movie before because, well, frankly, what's the point? I mean, what's there to say about this movie or its sequels that no one has ever said before or heard before? But then I thought about the TV series. Or serieses? Series I? I don't know. Apparently it's taboo in this fandom to refer to these as one show when they pretty much are. It's not like a Clone Wars and Bad Batch situation, which is in the same time frame but shifts the focus to different characters. It's the same show. I know y'all don't want to hear this, but it is. The only difference is the time skip between Defenders and Race to the Edge. Not that it really matters since I am focusing primarily on Race to the Edge in this video. I just wanted to piss people off because frankly, I get off on that and I haven't had a good wank since Big Hero 6 the series ended. Of course, I could always review Brother Bear. That would certainly do the trick. But yeah, I figured since there is an audience for Race of the Edge related content, I might as well take advantage of it. And since my good friend Audrey Graywin, the supposed number one How to Your Dragon YouTuber on the side has yet to make a Race to the Edge video. Fine. I'll do it myself. Race to the Edge, the TV series that aired on Netflix and spans a whopping six seasons. Eight if you're logical like me. I will burn your fucking house down. Did somebody say something? The show takes place between movies one and two and focuses on Hiccup and his crew as they go to this place called the Dragon's Edge. They discover new dragons, learn about this ancient treasure called the Dragon Eye, and work together in order to face off against a new group of villains. It's pretty much what you would expect from a Head Junior Dragon TV show. And yeah, it was actually pretty good when it was on air. The animation wasn't on par with the films, which is to be expected, but the show did well with what it had. The new dragons they introduced were really cool and imaginative. I like how they all came in various different shapes and forms 
arms, like how the buffalo was just a big cow, or how the screaming death burrows through the ground like a big drill. You had the sentinels, which were like statues, the triple strike, which was like a big scorpion. All these dragons were really cool and inventive, and all had various different abilities that helped them feel like real animals. The show also expanded on the side characters, and gave them more fleshed out personalities, which is great considering they were one of the weakest elements of the movies. In the movies, they were just comic relief and not much else. In fact, I don't think they even had any plot relevancy in the second movie at all. So to see them get developed further and be more than just the D&D guy or the bully was actually kind of nice. I still hate the twins though. Yeah, they've always been the worst to me and they still are the worst part of the entire trilogy and this show did nothing to do them any favors. I've always found them to be annoying and unlikable. In fact, one of the worst episodes in the entire series is the one where Astra has to learn to like them. Apparently her being annoyed by their childish behavior made Astra a uber bitch. <laughs> No. Her anger at them was 100% justified, and the episode trying to gaslight me into sympathizing with the twins was almost on par with the Nine Realms trying that shit with June in Season 4. Not gonna happen, guys! But honestly, I wanted to focus on one particular aspect of the show, rather than do a full analysis on it as a whole. Because to me, Race of the Edge was a good show, and that's it. It's just a good show. Not a great one. FBI, open up! Look, I'm sorry I don't love this show the same way a lot of you do, but for me, a show like this is missing something that's really crucial to be up there with shows like Avatar, or The Owl House, or whatever. Now that's not to say it has to be as good as Avatar to be a great show, I'm just saying it's lacking something. For you see, Race of the Edge is a midquel, and thus it's stuck between a rock and a hard place. The writers have no real control over how the show starts or how it ends. No matter what happens within the show, it can't stick unless it somehow ties into the second movie. Oh no, Astrid got really sick and could possibly die from this deadly disease. Oh no, wait, she's perfectly fine in the second movie, so she'll get over it. Oh no, Astrid got blinded by lightning. I sure hope she'll be okay. Oh wait, she can see in the second movie, so... Yeah, she'll be fine. Oh shit! Astrid got shot with a narrow- My god, the writers must have fucking hated Astrid. They bodied her the whole show, didn't they? It's a hard knock for us. It's a hard knock But you get my point, right? Now, this isn't a problem that's exclusive to Race of the Edge. It's pretty much an inevitability for any midquel, really. If it doesn't happen in the seceding property, then you can't do it in this property. If a character isn't dead at a later point, then you can't kill them off at this point. Unless specified to happen, your hands are pretty much tied and you can't do shit. You're basically stuck doing minimal filler tasks that have no real bearing or connection to the main trilogy, and that's honestly Race of the Edge's biggest issue. It's pretty much all filler. Because the show takes place in a location called The Edge, which is conveniently hundreds of miles away from Berg, then the writers have a much easier time coming up with stories that have nothing to do with the movies outside of just simply having the characters from the movies be there and that's it. To me, Race of the Edge is a show you can watch, and I do recommend it, but at the same time, if you choose to just stick with the movies, you won't miss a thing. I mean, sure, it's cool to see how Stoic gets his dragon skull crusher, but considering how it just makes sense for Stoic to get his own dragon in the five year gap between movies one and two, it's something that's easy to buy without really needing the context behind it. Like I said, it's something you can watch, just not something you need to watch. Which I know isn't really a compliment, but the show is good overall. It's like a 7 out of 10. I just think it could have been better, that's all. Mainly because I've seen a Mikul show that actually works phenomenally. Like, it's honestly kind of stupid how much it works. It shouldn't work at all, and yet it works. Like a stripper on a Saturday night, it works. And you saw the thumbnail, so you know what the show is already, so let's just talk about... I mean, god damn, how did this show work? This is a show that, by all accounts, should not have worked. I mean, it's Star Wars The Clone Wars, and not the Gendy version. Instead of General Grievous taking on six Jedi and winning, in this version, he's defeated by Jar Jar fucking Binks. So like I said, this shouldn't have worked. When it was first announced back in 2008, people simply saw it as George Lucas trying to squeeze more money out of Star Wars. 
and after the prequel trilogy left fans disappointed before they understood what real disappointment looked like, it was mainly kids who watched the show. And for the first two seasons, it was exactly what we expected from it. It wasn't anywhere near as bad as the prequel trilogy, but it was just kinda whatever. It was just some filler side quest stuff with the characters we've already gotten used to from the movies, and just like Race to the Edge, it suffered because of it. Oh no, this German stereotype is gonna destroy Naboo with this deadly disease! Except Naboo is fine in episode 3, so why should I care? Oh no! Anakin and Obi-Wan got captured by pirates! I sure hope nothing bad happens to them, except no. Y you see what I mean? Now, that's not me saying it's automatically gonna be bad, or is bad. I'm just saying it's not gonna be anywhere near as compelling as it's trying to be. It's just filler side quest stuff and nothing else. Then season 3 came around, and things began to take a turn. The show began to shift its focus towards other aspects of the galaxy that weren't explored in the movies. Sure, we saw episodes about the clones and Asajj Ventress in the previous two seasons, but not much happened yet that still didn't feel like Saturday morning, if that makes sense. Suddenly, the show was giving more episodes to specific arcs. Some arcs lasted up to four episodes and focused mainly on characters we didn't get to see a lot of in the movies, like Dooku and Grievous, or at all like Domino Squad, Ventress, and especially Ahsoka Tano. Ahsoka was the game changer for the show. When she was first introduced, people fucking hated her. She was stuck up, annoying, people couldn't stand her snippy personality, and Anakin making a joke about it didn't exactly help. But as the show carried on and focused on her more, it became more and more clear that her snippy personality was always meant to be curtailed. Every time she overestimated herself or underestimated her enemy, it always bit her in the ass. She got beaten, captured, or even got people killed unnecessarily because of her actions. By season three, her mood and personality personality had shifted. She was much wiser and more mature than she was in season 1, and the season 3 finale put that to the test when she was forced to lead a group of Padawans to safety after being captured and then hunted for sport by Trandoshans. From that point on, Ahsoka became a definitive part of what made The Clone Wars such a great show. Watching her development from beginning to end was truly captivating and interesting, but more importantly, it was her connection to Anakin that really solidified the Clone Wars as a crucial part of the story of Star Wars. First off, let's talk about Anakin for a second. It's incredible how they managed to improve him in this show. You probably don't need me to tell you this, but in the prequel trilogy, Anakin is unbeatable. Bearable. He's whiny, he's horny, he's annoying and horny. He's at times almost pathologically disturbed and cries so horny. I get he's supposed to turn to the dark side, but it's really hard to see this. I don't like sand. It's coarse, rough and irritating, and it gets everywhere. Become this. Holy fucking shit. Now, of course, this was not Hayden Christensen's fault at all. He was just doing what he was told to do. This was just George Lucas's awful attempt at becoming a modern-day Shakespeare with this awful dialogue that nobody uses. We used to come here for school retreat. We would swim to that island every day. I love the water. We used to lie out on the sand and let the sun dry us and try to guess the names of the birds singing. They didn't talk like this in the original trilogy. Hell, they didn't even talk like that in The Phantom Menace. So why are you talking like this now? Look, my point is they managed to do the impossible. They actually made Anakin in The Clone Wars a very likable and sympathetic character. He went from being a whiny teenage pissant to a dashing, charming hero with a mean streak. He's loyal to those he cares about and is compassionate to a fault. It was his attachment to others like his wife Padme that led to his descent to the dark side in Revenge of the Sith. However, his actual descent in the movies was really not well handled. Because A, again, it's hard to picture this whiny annoying asshole as the eventual Lord of the Sith, and B, it just felt really rushed and out of nowhere when he suddenly decides to become Darth Vader. But the show really took its time to try and showcase both his devotion to those he cares about and his dark tendencies. In the beginning of the show, it was pretty small stuff, like lashing out at people or whatever, but as the show progressed, so did Anakin's dark side. He would beat people, torture them at times, and by the final season, he would straight up cut off a guy's arms. You're a Jedi. You're no I don't have such weaknesses. 
Now let's try that again. Now that is a young Darth Vader. My point is, it's insane how important the Clone Wars would become to Star Wars as a whole. How it not only managed to fix the mistakes of the past, but also add on to it in a way that improves the future. And a lot of that was thanks to Ahsoka. Her presence in the show and her relationship with Anakin would go on to become one of the most, if not perhaps the single most pivotal relationship in all of Star Wars. In Season 5 of The Clone Wars, Ahsoka would be accused of a crime that she didn't commit. Desperate to prove her innocence, she would run from the Republic and the Jedi Order who have both disowned her in the process. The only person that doesn't believe she's guilty is Anakin. Anakin, in his character flaw, chooses his loyalty to his Padawan over anyone else. Now granted, Ahsoka is innocent and Anakin was right, but it doesn't change the fact that he sided with Ahsoka over the Jedi Council, which is kind of a big no-no if you're a Jedi. It's another thing the show explained really well, the hypocrisy of the Jedi. While having compassion for others is seen as a good thing, you also can't have attachments. This includes family, friends, or even husbands and wives. This also extends to Padawans and their masters. While it is good that they care about each other, and it's pretty inevitable that you're going to form a connection with someone you spend so much time with, it's still important to the Jedi faith that you learn to let go. But Anakin has already broken this rule by having a wife. Unlike most Jedi who are brought to the Jedi as babies, Anakin was about eight or nine years old, meaning that his connection to his mother had already gotten to him. In The Phantom Menace, they bring up that fact and how that could complicate his training, and sadly, they'd be right in their assumptions, as he would later choose his devotion to his wife over his commitment to the Jedi Council. But it wasn't just that. What used to be a simple thing has become a huge, multifaceted thing that all builds up to him becoming Darth Vader, because it all stems from his connection to others. His wife Padme, his master Obi-Wan, and now his apprentice Ahsoka Tano. Throughout the show, Anakin and Ahsoka clearly became very close to each other. Ew, no, not that close, you fucking weirdos. She became more like a little sister to him. Jesus, why do I even get on the internet sometimes? By the season five finale, Anakin managed to capture the true culprit and proved Ahsoka's innocence. However, it wasn't enough in the end. Even though she would always be grateful to him for standing by her side, it didn't change the fact that the Jedi didn't. When the Jedi welcome her back, they only bring up how much stronger of a Jedi she's become. They didn't trust her when she needed them, so she realizes that if she stays a Jedi, then a Jedi is all she'll ever be. She realizes now that she's a lot like Anakin. Almost too much like Anakin. The best parts of him anyway. She doesn't have his anger, but she does have his compassion. She tells Anakin that she needs to find out who she is without the Jedi and without him. She's not leaving to hurt him, but it does. It hurts both of them. Anakin tells her that he understands her decision and has even thought about it himself to leave the Jedi Order, to which she replies, I know. And so, with tears in her eyes, she walks away from everything that she's ever known and everything that's important to her, especially her master, Anakin. Ahsoka has had such a profound impact on Anakin as a whole, and her leaving is one of many building blocks that led to his eventual descent to the dark side. Suddenly, the moment where he does become Darth Vader has so much more weight and build up behind it. Now, whenever you see Anakin swearing his allegiance to Palpatine, you think about Ahsoka leaving him behind and wondering what could have happened should she have stayed. Could she have maybe prevented his downfall? Was it actually her fault that it all happened? Like I said earlier, the Clone Wars has no right to be as good as it is. It could have just been some little sideshow with some nice animation and characters. It could have played itself safe and nobody would have cared. But no, they did something different. They chose to get focused to the things that needed it the most in the movies, but didn't get it. And along the way, gave us one of the most important characters in all of Star Wars. It's not just her, mind you, but she is, for sure, one of the main reasons that Star Wars The Clone Wars is a great show and a must-watch. Rise of the Edge is not a must-watch. <gasps> did he just say, I... He did. You see, thanks to Ahsoka, among other things, the Clone Wars became so connected to the prequel trilogy and the character of Anakin as a whole that it's impossible to skip over it. You just can't. And if you try, then you're doing yourself a major disservice. It's become imperative to watch the Clone Wars in order to understand just how we get to where we are in the movies. Even to this day, Ahsoka is still affecting Star Wars in an insane way. Almost to the point where people are getting kind of sick of it, to be honest. But Race to the Edge just isn't like that. Instead, it chose to play itself safe and not have its story and characters really tie into the locations or the themes of the movies. And the fact that it lasted eight whopping seasons is kind of ridiculous. Even the Clone Wars didn't last that long. 
Now, granted, it wanted to, but Disney canceled it when they bought Star Wars, but I digress. Again, I'm not saying the show is bad, but this weakness and the writers choosing to play things safely just really holds it back. It could have been up there with shows like Avatar or The Clone Wars, but no, it's just a good show. But it could have been great, and I think they could have done that if they told the story with Heather. <laughs> Guys, I'm like nine pages into my script right now. While all the main characters are stuck in the wall, that can't really impact the big picture of How to Train Your Dragon. The story isn't really the same for Heather. The same could be said for pretty much any original character in the show. Dagger, Mala, Vigo, etc. While we all know where Hiccup and the others are going to end up by the end, the same can't really be said for Heather or her brother, can they? Their story is entirely up in the air, and as such, you can do whatever you want with them. Kind of like what the Clone Wars did with Ahsoka. Yeah, you see where I'm going with this now, right? I think that shows, movies, video games, whatever, that are midquels or even prequels should try to focus on the more original content. I mean, look at Red Dead Redemption 2. The main character, Arthur Morgan, was never even mentioned in the first game. And yet now, it's impossible to think about John Marston without thinking about everything that Arthur did for him. John Marston would not be who he is in the first game were it not for Arthur in the second game. And the same could be said about Ahsoka in The Clone Wars. She made such an impact on the characters from the movies that if you were to remove her completely, it just wouldn't be the same anymore. And for the first three seasons of Race to the Edge, it seemed like Heather could have been that. Heather was first introduced in Riders of Burke as a spy for Mark Hamill. And yes, I know Alvin's real name, but he's also Mark Hamill and we stand him on this channel. Mark Hamill captured Heather's parents and basically forced her to try and bring him the Book of Dragons so he could train dragons himself. One thing leads to another and Heather's parents are saved and Mark Hamill is defeated. Heather sails away with her family and they lived happily ever after. Actually, no, they don't. We cut to season one, episode 10 of Race to the Edge, where a dragon is attacked merchant ships. It's revealed in the episode that it is, in fact, Heather and her new dragon, Windshear, a razor whip. A dragon that, I'm not gonna lie, is a pretty dope-ass dragon. It's just a really sick design all around. I love it. So it's been three years and a lot has changed. We find out that Heather's adopted parents have been killed by Dagger the Deranged. Sadly, we don't get to see that. That'd actually be really interesting to see. I mean, if the movies can kill people, I don't see any reason for why the show couldn't do it since they're both similar in tone. Also, characters do die in the show, so I don't want to hear any bitching about this being a kid's show and it can't be done because it's in a Appropriate. Oh, fuck off with that. Personally, I think it would have been a really cool idea if we got to see this with a flashback or something. Honestly, you could have made a whole episode of Heather being on her own and finding Windshear and doing all that stuff. Kind of like a Zuko Alone episode where she remembers the things she learned on Burke, all while forming a bond with Windshear in the process. Hell, you could have done an episode like that any time in the first three seasons. You notice how Heather just always kind of runs off on her own in the first couple of seasons? Like, she's not ready to be around people or whatever. She needs to take time to figure things out. That could have been an episode or two. Instead of pointless filler episodes that have no weight or anything to them, like that episode where Barf and Belch like Hiccup or whatever, we could have actually tried to explore Heather and her connection with her adopted a family. You know, I don't think we even learn exactly how she got separated from her real family, do we? Her backstory is honestly pretty vague. It's just like, oh, I got separated from them when I was a baby, and that's it. Oh! Okay! In that case, do you think you could elaborate? Imagine a cool flashback episode where maybe Dagger would explain what happened to her. Or maybe they find a note that explains how Heather disappeared. Here's an idea. We know that Oswald the Agreeable disappeared in some vague way. Apparently he was looking for answers to something somewhere out there and ended up getting shipwrecked on Vanaheim. Why not try to elaborate on this a bit? Maybe Oswald brought a small crew, including his two children, with him on a journey to... Uh, let's say protect some dragons or whatever, okay? Oswald's a nice guy, he's gotta be doing something nice. Anyway, a bad storm would come in and cause the ship to fall apart. During the chaos, Heather, still a toddler, ends up in one lifeboat and Dagger ends up in another. Eventually, Heather would drift until she ends up on the island where her adoptive parents live, and then we just go from there. I know it's not amazing, but it does establish the backstory that just feels too vague to truly get invested in. Dagger would initially explain what happened, and by explain, I mean exaggerate a couple of things, mainly revolving around trying to stick to the story that he killed his father. Oswald went crazy and Dagger had to kill him in order to save the crew. His bold actions led him to become the new chief of the Berserker tribe. Easy story to believe. 
especially since he was conveniently the only survivor of that shipwreck, save for the toddler who can't remember anything. Of course, eventually, Dagger would reveal the full truth to her, but we'll get to that soon. I actually like the idea that she is, in fact, Dagger's long-lost sister. It's interesting, and not to mention something the writers have full control over. This is precisely why they couldn't actually have Heather be Hiccup's half-sister, despite how interesting that in itself would have been. You can tell the writers really just wanted these three to be siblings. Dagger calls Hiccup brother all the time, they have that sibling vibe. These moments are cute. They have good chemistry. Still, it just feels like a missed opportunity that after she learns the truth, she just disappears and we don't see her until the next season. Fortunately though, season two is a lot better for Heather. Because this season, she's at least doing stuff. In this season, Heather has been reunited with her brother, but it seems as though she switched sides and now she's working with her brother and the Dragon Hunters. Except no, she's actually working undercover. I like that Heather actually starts to get more focus in this particular season. That her actions actually kind of have consequences that affect our main characters. There are actual stakes that I'm invested in because, as I said earlier, we don't know what happens to Heather in the end. There's this great scene in the episode Snow Way Out where you actually think for a second that Hiccup's gonna seriously hurt her. Then in the two-part season finale, we get to meet the main antagonist of the show and easily the best antagonist of the entire franchise, Vigo Grimborn. Well, we're talking about Heather in this video, so maybe Audrey will talk about him someday. There's this great scene in the episode Maces and Talons Part 1 where Vigo tells Heather that he's looking for someone he can trust. He walks her over to this cliffside and he mentions the fact that there's a traitor among them and that someone could be sus. Fortunately, Heather is not eliminated, but the tension in that scene was genuinely really strong. If you put someone like Hiccup or Astra in a similar scenario, I don't think it would work as well. Eventually though, Heather is found out to be the imposter and she's quickly thrown out of the ship. You set this whole thing up. He's called the imposter. Some call him the traitor. I thought you should have it. We come from a proud and historic tribe of Vikings. Berserkers. We don't turn on each other. We stand for each other. I know you, Tagger. We share the same blood. Can I ask you something, sister? Of course. Anything. Are, are, are we okay, you and I, on that whole thing, you know? Still some lingering feelings of skepticism? Thought so. <laughs> Yeah, remember this conversation, because the writers might not. In the finale episode of season two, Dagger sets Heather free as despite what she did, he's actually grown to care about her. And Heather just disappears again. <sighs> okay, guess the writers just don't have anything for her to do, again. Till next season. Season three, Heather doesn't show up for six whole episodes. But Dagger does. In the episode Enemy of My Enemy, Hiccup goes out to do some recon and ends up getting shot down by dragon hunters. It's on this little island where he finds Dagger. After months of being stranded, Dagger has thought a lot about his past actions and decides that he wants to find Heather and make amends for everything that he's done. In the episode, he actually ends up saving Toothless and Hiccup's lives before sailing away on his own. We then cut to episode 7, to Heather or not to Heather, yeah, great episode name by the way, where it's revealed that Heather's been sending thirsty love poems to the one and only fish legs. Uh, okay. Yeah, I guess it's time we talk about that. I've been corresponding with a certain someone who has been returning my terror mails in kind. You happy? Who is she, Fishlegs? Who said it's a she? Look, I like Fishlegs in the show. I do. He's a lot more fleshed out here than he was in the movies. He's actually got way more going on than just talking D&D &D statistics and being an overall creep. Like, seriously, why are you like this now? This is, is not okay. This needs to stop now. This is cancer. He's the best friend of Hiccup that existed in the books and that we didn't get to see in the movies. He loves dragons of all shapes and sizes, especially his beloved Meat Lug. Now, with that being said, I'm not really that big a fan of this relationship. It's nothing like Tom and June, but it mostly just feels unnecessary. We already know it's not gonna last, and on top of that, it doesn't really tie into anything that affects either character. I'm not against the romance per se, but it needs to have a purpose. Like, them not working out in the end actually needs to affect them in some significant way that actually has payoff later. After they break up in season four, the show just acts like the relationship never happened. I'm glad they didn't go down that dumb love triangle route between Heather, Astrid, and Hiccup, because that kind of shit would have just gotten tedious really quickly. Not to mention, again, we know who Hiccup ends up with, so it would have just given me mad vibes of Korra, Asami, and Mako. And the less we think about that, the better. With that being said, Fishlegs and Heather had potential, but they just didn't do anything substantial with it. Besides, Heather has mad lesbian vibes and everyone in this fandom knows it. Not hard to believe considering her voice actor 
actress Mae Whitman has voiced lesbians before and after. Also, she's pansexual, fun fact. Anyway, episode 7, I guess, gives Heather a reason to actually stay at the edge and thus in the show. Now she's dating fish legs, so she has to stay. Like I said, it's just a reason for her to stay. I remember back when the show was airing, people hated the episode Tone Deaf because of the song that Heather sings to the Baby Death song. I even remember somebody saying it was too quote unquote Disney for them. Uh, I'm sorry, but has that person ever even seen a Disney movie before? It was just a cute little lullaby, not a vast stage piece. Get over yourself. So now Heather is here at the edge and actually gets to take part in the Avengers, which is kind of what I was hoping for for a while at that point. Now that there's a character among the crew that's actually a mystery, I can now get way more invested. And no episode made it more clear of Heather's potential than in episode 11, Family on the Edge. I'm not kidding when I say this is my favorite episode in the entire show. All eight seasons of it. This is the episode where I began to truly get invested in the show the same way I did with Star Wars The Clone Wars. Huh. Funny how it was in the third season that this happened. In season three of The Clone Wars, it was the Night Sister arc that focused mainly on Asajj Ventress getting revenge on Dooku. And now in Race to the Edge, it's Heather finally confronting her brother on everything that's happened to her. Which leads me back to the season two finale. Now, you can argue she was just saying that to try and get out of being captured, sure, but... It's not like she was particularly angry when Dagger let her go. She could have easily killed him right there if that's what she truly wanted. So for Heather to just suddenly be back on the whole killing Dagger is all that matters train honestly feels a bit out of nowhere. If anything, she should have been at a crossroads already, wondering about why Dagger would even do that to begin with and questioning whether she should go through with it at all. But with that being said, you can argue that she already is. She did say this earlier in episode seven. All that time with Dagger, we were playing a part. I didn't have a minute to think about the fact that he is actually my brother. But even then, it's weird that she didn't really mention wanting to kill Dagger up until this particular episode where Dagger comes to the edge, which begs the question, why didn't Dagger just come back to the edge sooner? He did ask Hiccup how she was doing, and Hiccup did reply, so why didn't he just make the assumption they'd be together? Granted, she wasn't at the time, but Dagger didn't know that. So episode 11 focuses mainly on Hiccup trying to teach Dagger how to ride a dragon in the hopes that he'll leave before Heather can find him and kill him. During this time, he ends up becoming friends with the other riders who he's tried to kill multiple times throughout the show, save for Snoutloud. Dagger and Fishlegs bond over their love for Gronkles. Astrid becomes genuinely impressed with his ability to bond with the dragon so quickly. Even the twins like him since he's totally in tune with their own brand of insanity. It actually seems like Dagger's road to redemption is actually going pretty well. Then Heather shows up, and it all goes to shit. Heather lets loose completely about how Dagger murdered not only her adoptive parents, but also their biological father as well. She also accuses him of still working for Vigo, which Dagger denies. Nobody believes him, of course. I mean, why would they? Even he admitted that he doesn't deserve the benefit of the doubt. Dagger, why in the name of Thor should I believe a word you say? You shouldn't. I don't deserve the benefit of the doubt. So he walks away, upset that his sister, the only person he really has left, won't even hear him out. Eventually, Dagger discovers the Rider's plan to attack Vico's fleet, but Dagger, having more brain cells than usual actually, is able to see the obvious trap. Dagger is locked away because the others don't trust him, but he's able to break out pretty easily. I like how Dagger actually uses some of the stuff that Fishlegs taught him in order to troll Heather one last time just before, well, his moment. <laughs> This was the moment I actually kind of fell in love with this show. You can actually see the moment where our hearts break. Dagger just had to prove himself right, didn't he? It's not his fault, of course, but still. He could have flown out of there after proving his point, maybe even join up with the others to finish the fight. But that's not the Berserker way, is it? Hiccup blames himself for not listening to Dagger. Dagger saved his life before and was clearly trying to redeem himself. The others express careful optimism and their remorse. Heather, however, comments that her brother didn't sacrifice himself. He thought he could make it. To which Hiccup replies, I just never heard you call Dagger brother before. I need some sleep. Heather goes to a room where she finds a letter left by Dagger. 
This is my favorite scene in the entire show. From the somber music playing over the scene to this incredible overhead shot that goes in and out of focus as Heather walks across the decks, all while Dagger's last words are running through her head. In the letter, he admits that he actually didn't kill their father and only lied about it so that he could seize power, but he wanted Heather to know the truth so that maybe she wouldn't just see him as a murderer anymore. Dagger did a lot of bad things, but the least he wanted for Heather to know was that in the end, he tried. He tried to make things right. And Heather can't bring herself to deny that. It's just too much for her to bear. Easily the most compelling part of the show has to be Heather. From losing her home to invaders, to learning how to trust a dragon after being afraid of them, to learning who her real family is. And then it turns out that her real family killed her adoptive one, so she opted to try and get revenge just as her brother was opting for redemption. All the stuff with Vigo and Hiccup and stuff, it's good, but I'm not as invested with them because I know where it's going. And I don't fault the writers for that, but with Heather, it's a different story. With her, there are no limitations to what you can do. You can have her save Hiccup's life, or you can just straight up have her die. The Heather Ball is entirely in your court, and I think that's what made Ahsoka so compelling in Star Wars 2. She started off as just Anakin's apprentice and nothing else, but slowly and surely, she grew into her own story. By season five, we were invested in Ahsoka, not just because of who her master was, but because of who she was. There's a reason why fans of the Clone Wars were begging to get a season seven for years until we finally got it. And I firmly believe that Heather could have easily been this show's Ahsoka. Her story was actually outshining the other main characters and I was completely invested. That's when I got the feeling that Race to the Edge would be something special. Not perfect, definitely not, but still. Too bad they fucked it up. You Dad. fucked up. You fucked up. You fucked up. Season four. Oh, look who's alive. Dagger. Dagger's alive. Ain't that great, kids? Now his sacrifice in the last season doesn't have to mean shit anymore. Don't you just love that so fucking much? Why did you do this? Why did you do this? Oh, fuck. I can't believe you've done this. You had the potential to really send Heather off on her own journey of self-discovery. She just lost the last of her bloodline. She is all that is left of both her adopted tribe and her original tribe. Sure, she's got the writers, but they're not exactly family. Not really. Heather could have gone on this insane journey of self-discovery, redemption, forgiveness, etc. But instead, they played it super safe with her. Now that Dagger is alive and well, we know exactly where her story is going. She and Dagger will talk it out. She'll eventually learn to forgive him. She'll ride off with him to reform the Berserker tribe. And that's exactly what happens. Sorry, but it just feels so cheap the way they resolve Heather and Dagger's relationship. For starters, Dagger should have never been brought back. Period. Not only does it show that there's actual stakes in this war between Hiccup and Vigo, but it also leaves Heather in a state where she doesn't know what she wants to do. She's confused about how she feels about Dagger. She still hates him for destroying her village, but she also recognizes that he saved her multiple times at that point. I think it would have been much better if she never fully forgave him. There was still this resentment there for the pain that he caused her, but at the same time, she realizes that he was genuine in the fact that he cared about her and wanted to change. This would inspire her to go off on her own, breaking things off with fish legs in the process to learn the truth about their father. Instead of Dagger finding Vanaheim and Oswald's body, it would be Heather who did instead. With the truth about her real father discovered, she decided to try and rebuild the Berserker tribe herself as its new chief. Something that represents the change that Dagger was trying to obtain. And hell, while she's at it, Maybe have the Berserker tribe link up with the Defenders of the Wing. I mean, that pretty much happens in the show anyway, so I don't see why not. For the last two seasons of the show, Heather is just a complete afterthought. She has practically zero presence in the show, save for like the final episode of season five when she learns about Oswald. I honestly can't remember a single thing that she does in the final season. You can tell the writers just had no idea what to really do with her anymore. They practically wrapped her story up in season four anyway, so what else is there? Now, I know that was never the plan. Netflix greenlit two more seasons out of nowhere and the writers just weren't prepared for that. You can tell because these last two seasons are honestly not good at all. They're super rushed and feel super desperate for ideas. I mean, they made Johan an antagonist. Excuse me, what? Not only that, he's also like the grand mastermind behind the whole thing.
Excuse me, what? There was zero build up to this. No foreshadowing, nothing that even remotely hints that he was the main antagonist all along. It is a baffling twist villain that makes shit like the Sheep from Zootopia comparable to Scar or Maleficent. Dagger is also pretty useless in these last two seasons. You can tell right away that bringing him back was a mistake. Outside of learning about what happened to Oswald, which I said before could have easily been done with Heather instead, let's just uh, shoehorn him into this weird dominatrix-esque relationship with Mom. Sure, it's funny, but still, name one other thing Dagger does in these two seasons outside of that that warrants him being alive still. I guess it's cool to see how the Wing Maidens function, and since they raise baby Razor Whips, it only makes more sense for Hala to become a chief and link her new tribe together with these people. The ideas are there, they just didn't have enough time to do anything with it. God, it sucks. They had the story they wanted to tell, but were then given two more seasons that they didn't plan for. If the writers just had more time to plan ahead for these two seasons, then maybe they wouldn't have brought Dagger back. Maybe they wouldn't have made Johan the main antagonist out of nowhere. I don't know, I'm just speculating at this point. Still, it just feels like Heather had a really good story that was compelling and interesting and unique to the Hatter Chain Dragon franchise, but they just fumbled it in the second half by playing it too safe. Instead of Heather having to live with the fact that she may never come to terms with her brother, they bring him back and it's all resolved in a super clean fashion. It's just <sighs> disappointing. It always hurts the most to see something that has that potential be wasted with a super safe execution. So, if you'll permit me, viewers, allow me to get a little fan -y for a minute on how I think Heather should have been handled. I already went over some ideas on what I would have done, like how Heather and Dagger got separated in the first place, maybe give Heather an episode of her own, stuff like that. Let's start off at the end of Season 3 and head on from there. I won't go into a huge ton of detail because we've been here long enough, just a general summarization pretty much. So after Dagger's death, Heather will be conflicted on what to do next. Eventually she'll come to the realization that she needs to learn the truth about her father. Fishlegs would recommend that she just try to move on from the whole thing and settle down with him. In this particular instance, he would come on just a touch too strong and this would somewhat unnerve Heather and cause her to officially break things off. Fishlegs would, however, take it as him not being assertive enough, and this would eventually lead to how he ends up being in the second movie. Now, I need to emphasize this right now. I fucking hate how he turned out in the second movie. This Pepe Le Pew bullshit right here isn't funny, was never funny, and is an outdated trope that needs to fucking die. Now with that being said, I'm only going along with this because it has to link up with the second movie somehow. Heather would learn the truth about Oswald and be even more upset, believing more than ever that she's all alone in the world with no one. She just broke it off with fish legs so she can't just go back to the edge. For the first time since she's lost her village, all she has left is her dragon wind shear. Suddenly, Windshear would react to a sound. It's a sound that it recognizes. Suddenly, Heather is surrounded by the Wing Maidens who notice her bond with her dragon. They bring her to Mala, where she's welcomed with open arms, and she proceeds to stay there for a while. In this headcanon, the defenders of the Wing and the Wing Maidens are one and the same. It just doesn't make much sense for there to be two groups of dragons defenders when one should be enough. Eventually Hiccup and the others would show up, and she, of course, would be happy to see them. She's a little upset to see that Fishlegs has already moved on to Roughnut, but Astrid helps her overcome this by telling her that she and Hiccup are finally a thing. Astrid is also quick to notice that Heather's gotten quite close to Mala in the last couple of months that have passed. I mean, might as well, she did have those mad lesbian vibes. Also, she deserves to be happy, so why not? It worked for Dagger, so why wouldn't it work for Heather? She is still a berserker deep down. The rest of the show would relatively go as it did normally, only Heather would take Dagger's role as Mala's future wife. She'd complete the trials and all. Eventually, the berserker tribe is reborn and joins forces with the wing maidens. They rule together as dual chiefs slash queens, and their island becomes a new safe haven for dragons everywhere. And it remains that way for many years to come. Let's say 1300 years later? Yeah, why not? Let's say for whatever reason, we have to make the Nine Realms. It has to happen no matter what. We have a gun to our head and we have no choice. But we're in total control of the show and we get to decide where it goes from here. So if you've seen my Nine Realms videos, you know how I suggested that Icarus should have just started out as protectors of the dragons to begin with. So let's go with that. The show would begin with Tom and his friends being introduced to the world of dragons. In my interpretation, Icarus is the descendant of the maidens who protected dragons. They also wouldn't be called Icarus. Instead, they'd be called Razorcore, which I like way better.
The show would actually be a lot more similar to the books, where it's kind of like a school of them learning how to train dragons. Like in the actual show, Tom would meet up with a nightlight and be a descendant of Vikings. But the change I'm making is that they're all descendants, which is why they're all there in the first place. They all have the blood right to know and be a part of it. Like in the show, Tom would want to learn about his past and also try to find more nightlights. And of course, he would discover his ancestral roots. Tom would be an Ingerman. Minute. Yeah, it turns out that Alex is actually the true descendant of Hiccup because she yes. deserves it. I mean, have you seen Olivia's chin? Don't tell me that ain't Roughnut's chin right there. Roughnut and Fishlegs do eventually get together anyway, so yeah, considering how lovey-dovey they were in Homecoming, it only makes sense that kids showed up eventually, right? Now wait just a minute, Razorblade. How can that be? Alex has two moms, which means they couldn't have possibly conceived her. Ha! Counterpoint, bitch! One of Alex's moms is actually bisexual. She had a husband in the past, conceived Alex with said husband, got a divorce, and then got remarried. Boom! Suck a dick, hater! I thought this through. Now, where the show would go on from there, I honestly don't care at this point. I just wanted to try and fix the Nine Realms while I was at it, because why not? As well as actually try to tie it into How to Train Your Dragon in a way that didn't feel super forced or just plain dumb. You know, like how it actually turned out. How about you guys send me suggestions on how the show could have gone in that direction? Let me know in the comments below. Maybe I'll make another video reacting to your thoughts. That could actually be really fun. In the end, for me, Race to the Edge is just a good show. But it could have been great. If they didn't screw up with Heather in the second half, she really had the potential to be something really special to the How to Train Your Dragon franchise. Her story would have been unique, tragic, inspiring, and captivating all at the same time. And while it was for a little while, its conclusion just fell flat to me. Whether it was because the writers just chose to play it safe with her, or simply because they were suddenly given more episodes with no real planning, either way, Heather got botched. And I've always felt like she could have been better. She could have been to this show what Ahsoka was to Star Wars. Something completely independent from the films, open to any possibility, and was both a likable and compelling character in her own right. All the pieces were there, but they just didn't make a puzzle in the end. Race of the Edge is still a good show in the end. It's fun, it's well animated, it's cool to see the side characters get more development than in the movies, but that's sadly all it'll be a good show. Which isn't a bad thing to be. Sometimes a show can just be a good show and that's perfectly fine. I also think it's okay to be critical of good shows when they have flaws that, if fixed, could have put them up there as a great show. The show has flaws for sure, definitely in the last two seasons for sure, but Heather was both its greatest strength and also its biggest disappointment. When she could have been so much more. Truly, it is a tragedy. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to start focusing on another great show. One that I've been meaning to return to for quite some time. We're in...